Welcome to Knoxville, Tennessee. The home of Scott's Hot Rods and Customs. We spent some time with Justin Padfield, owner of Scott's Hot Rods, to discuss their parts business, some of their current hot rod builds, as well as the recent move to Tennessee. And we even managed to get a little history from Justin into his journey into the hot rod world. Hello, my name is Justin Scott Padfield. I'm the owner of Scott's Hot Rods and Customs Incorporated, located in Knoxville, Tennessee. All eyes on the way I thought when I walk into the room. Wind blows underneath the soles of my brand new pair of shoes. Got the attention. I'm on a mission. No sweat in the way I step. I got a fresh new attitude. father was Scott Richard Padfield. He had a shop by the name called Cycle Inn. He built custom Harleys, choppers. He was never building hot rods as a business. I was raised by my father um, <clears throat> my whole life. My dad was very protective over me. So my life was going to his bike shop before school, after school. Uh, when I was a kid, um, he taught me how to hit the arc well when I was five years old on gas tanks. Uh, Tom had to shape gas tanks on an English wheel at seven years old. And from there, it just kind of grew from there. I wasn't really a fan of building bikes at my dad's bike shop. My dad was associated with an outlaw bike club and I just didn't like the things that he was doing. But uh, he did keep me, you know, very isolated and protected. Wasn't allowed to go to a friend's house and spend the night at people's houses until I was um, older. It's because he was always so overprotective, you know, of me, which I'm not gonna say it, it affected me growing up, but I guess it probably made me work harder to what I wanted. When I uh, <clears throat> got a little bit older, you know, five, six, seven years old, I started playing uh, baseball, you know, sort of t-ball, and then went on the Little League and Pony League and Colt League and all that. Um, I had a passion for baseball. I was, I played uh, four seasons growing up. I played on uh, multiple uh, travel teams. Um, as I got older, uh, Legion teams, uh, the Cape Cod League, I got invited to my junior year in high school and played. My senior year in high school, I got drafted to play baseball. Um, that was my dream. Um, I did, did sign a contract. Fortunately for me though, I got hurt. I uh, fell off a four foot ladder in 1996. And what happened, I had a head injury. I hit my head on the concrete floor. And as you go four feet, well, it's not very high. Well, you're on the top step of the four foot ladder and the ladder actually broke. The, the aluminum channels and the ladder collapsed. I went head first in the concrete floor, knocked me unconscious. And when I woke up, um, I had a grand mal seizure. Didn't know what, what the seizure was going on as it started shaking violently. And it was actually, I was shaking violently on a stretcher in an ambulance. Paramedics uh, woke me up at the scene of the accident was, uh, I, I guess you call it the smelling cell. I'm not sure what it was, but it really woke me up. And I remember they asked me a question. They said, who's the president of the United States? I said, I am, of course. And they started laughing and I laughed too. And I remember going literally down the stairs on, on the stretcher and they got me in the ambulance. And I remember they were talking to me and all of a sudden I started shaking real bad. And all, after that, I just went to sleep. I just remember hearing the sirens on. Went to the hospital. Uh, my father came down, um, stayed at the hospital for those three days, and I had three more seizures that weekend. And that was probably the first time I saw my dad actually break down and cry in tears. You know, he was a, you know, you always have like a superhero. He was my superhero. You know, he was my best friend, my father. But um, also, I just never saw him break down, and he broke down because he was he felt helpless. He said, you know, there's nothing he can do to help me. 
from there, I, I had to go to um, several different doctors until we found the right uh, brain doctor, I call it, and they named Dr. David Brandis at North, Northridge Hospital. Uh, got me on <clears throat> several types of seizure medicines uh, from Dilantin, Neurontin, Tegretol, Deprecote. Uh, they had a lot of side effects. Um, the one side was called weight gain. Um, at that time, you know, I was 6% body fat. 236 pounds, you know, bench pressing 450 pounds, curling 300 pounds, and it was, I was an animal at that time. This is how my dad raised me. But at that time, I had to quit all activity. License got taken away. Couldn't ride a mountain bike no more, couldn't run an activity because I was having so many seizures uncontrollably. You know, he said that you can hurt yourself or kill somebody else in a car accident. I got what you call extremely depressed. Um, not, not in a point where it was suicidal, but just depressed. I hated everybody, hated everybody. Didn't care who you were, didn't know you, I just hated you. And um, it was my own hangup. And my, my reason was because, you know, I like to tell my dad, you know, I went to school every day, you know, Catholic school, you know, um, never got in trouble. I never stole from you. I never lied, you know, did my chores, did my things, practiced, worked out, was nice to people. Why this happened to me? And my dad, dad used to always say, well, it wasn't meant to be. And he'd say that and it pissed me off to no end, it pissed me off. And he's one guy that can get on my skin probably more than any of in this whole entire United States. And from that point there, you know, he told me when I, when I resulted I couldn't play ball anymore because I was having blackouts in the sun, um, he, would, he would get to me and say, you know, why don't, why don't you come to the bike shop and I'll take the business over. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want people to say that you got daddy's business and that's where it's at. So I said, I'm going to start doing hot rods. And he says, hot rods? You can't make money building hot rods. You know, you build, build bikes, make money building bikes. And um, so at, at, a very, at a very young age, meaning myself, when I was you know, 19 years old, he told me, you need to develop a product that you can sell. And I said, a product? He says, yeah. He said, because how many cars can you build a year? I said, hell, I have no idea. I don't have a customer to build a car yet. He says, well, let's say you build one car a year, if you can. You know, he says, what are you gonna charge to build that car? I have no idea. And um, he says, yeah, but if you build a product, you can sell it to a lot more people. And now my dad, his company cycle in, they built several Harley, Harley, Harley aftermarket parts for, at the time. Um, drag specialties, custom and chrome were his big clients. Um, so he was selling parts to them from like the seventies on up and done very well. I mean, we, we always lived decently. You know, we had a home, um, so on. So it was never, never deprived of a home or stuff like that. So I developed a suspension kit on airbags. Uh, we called the Scott Super Slam IFS. And I built it for a 1948 Ford F1 truck for a, for a lady out of Camarillo, California, who was an avocado rancher. And it was my first suspension I ever built in my entire life. It took probably six months to build it and um, got on the truck. And then from there, it just kind of branched off into more products. That was really the worst day of my life, losing my father. Because like I said, you know, he was my best friend, my father. But on top of that, I have a, a brother at the time who was five years old and a sister who was seven years old. And, um, you know, my dad raised me, but wasn't able to raise them. And that probably hurt me the most. And so, um, you know, I had to tell, tell my brother that our dad died, you know, that day at school. And uh, it was hard, it was hard. And um, <clears throat> it made me really focus more because now I didn't have my dad around to call him on the phone and ask him a question or get some advice. It just made me think of all the talks and conversations that he had with me growing up on what, how to do this and how to do that. And um, <clears throat> so, when, so when I buried my father at 24 years old, that's probably when I got really, really serious about my business. I mean, real serious. And just focused on really making Scott's hot rod something. I bought a friend's trailer, an open open car trailer, to take a chassis down to the Spring Nationals, good guys riding custom at Pomona, California. And when I pulled into the fairgrounds there, I realized that my trailer was one pile of shit trailer. And I so I parked it down by the NHR drag strip. And I unloaded the chassis and pushed the chassis with the easy up all the way to where the show was at. And it was, felt like it was 10 miles away, but it was only probably about a mile away. And a guy by the name of Gary Metters, the president of Good Guys Running Custom, at the time I didn't know who he was, uh, pulled up to my uh, where I was at and he asked me, where are you going? 
So I'm going to the hot rod show. Why are you parking your truck and trailer out here? I said, well, look at my trailer. Look at those trailers over there. Those are nice trailers. And he started laughing. He goes, well, grab this rope in the back of my car. And he tied it the chassis and towed me into the show. And it was hot that day. It was probably like 105 degrees, you know, and, and we got there. And that was the first time I went to a good guy show. I actually uh, borrowed the money off my friend to pay for the booth. It was a 10 by 20 booth. And, um, you know, I sold a couple of chassis there, which was kind of surprising because I, I never really sold really chassis at that point to anybody else. And that first show, and then when I came back, I realized I had to go buy me a trailer. So I went out and bought a uh, 28 foot um, enclosed trailer made by Hallmark. Hallmark is kind of a production built trailer, uh, very cheaply, probably weighed uh, 10,000 pounds. And I had a 1985 Chevy square body short bed fleet side truck with a 305 small block in it with 15 inch rally wheels lowered, pulling that trailer from Bakersfield, California down to Ventura, California. If anybody knows where Bakersfield, California is in 99, pretty deep uh, um, road called the Grapevine, the freeway there. And going up that, going up the freeway, what was the problem going 15 miles an hour pulling that trailer empty with that 305 small block. But when a semi truck came up and passed you, it blew you off the road a few times. So it kind of scared the crap out of me. And my one employee. I moved because I needed a um, a little bit uh, bigger building. It wasn't much bigger, but it was newer, and also in a little bit better area for business. And I was in uh, Oxnard from 2005 to 2018 at the location there off of uh, Del Norte Avenue. And at that time there, um, we got real serious on building a couple of roadsters. Um, I built uh, this one roadster named Undisputed. I, I had the car since I was. 1996 is when I started that car, and it was my personal car. I was born for myself just to showcase what we can do. I sold off to one of my customers, and we built that car, and the car debuted um, um, actually in Detroit in 2007. We flew the car on a plane out of Los Angeles International Airport, LAX, on Kitty Hawk Transportation, which was Connie Coletta's uh, planes, and they flew the plane from LA to, uh, um, to, to Indy. And we had a company by a called Advanced Plating. Steve Tracy picked up the, the car for us on his trailer and took it to uh, uh, Detroit for us. And our truck and trailer went out there because we, we ran out of time. And when we got there, the frame was damaged from the, from the hull. So we had to go to um, Iola, Michigan to a Dodge dealership and take the body off the frame the day before the Autorama and paint the bottom part of the frame, scuff it, clear it, paint it, and fortunately, the judges allowed us to bring the car in a little late that day and allowed us to work for the night to get our car ready for the show, and we did. The car got awarded the grade eight on Friday morning, which was you know, a huge, huge accomplishment from, for us and our, and our company. And from there, you know, that, that year, that was in 2007, and that's when um, a builder by the name of uh, Troy Trepanya, Raz by, Raz, Raz by Troy, built a car called the First Love, which was a, an awesome car, 36 Ford Coupe, that, that won the Riddler that year. And from there, after that show, we put the car in a bubble in our shop for a whole year. Didn't touch the car at all. It went to SEMA that year in BASF Glazer's paint booth, how the car was in Detroit. And at that time, uh, Steve Tracy came by the booth at uh, SEMA and asked what he did with the car. And I said, well, I got this crazy idea. What's that? I want to take it all down to the frame and send parts to you to re-chrome that we'll paint it and do a facelift on it. And we're gonna, Alan's gonna repaint this and we're gonna do this, 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 and this, and this. And we're gonna take it to the Grand National and we're gonna win America's Most Beautiful Roadster in 2008. And he looked at me like I was kind of crazy, but he also said, well, game on, let's get it done. And we did. We went down the Grand National Roadster Show, um, took the car down there. That year you had uh, Barry Lobeck, who was a great builder out of Ohio, had a, um, a 40 Ford Roadster, they called it, it was a 37, but it was a kind of a cool looking car that had out there. You had the alley cart, which was done by George Barris and Blackie Agajan were two legends. That Roy Bruzio restored was another legend in the business. Um, there was a lot of, um, yeah, Pete Shapores had a car down there. I mean, there was a lot of big, big builders out there that had cars down there. And um, we were there. Um, we had the car um, actually on a turntable, like a roulette wheel with a slot machine. 
because it was a Viva Las Vegas theme. So we went out and did the whole Las Vegas theme deal. You're there, you get nervous because you don't know, you know, if the car is going to be accepted, how the car is going to do. But we had a lot of people that saw the car in Detroit earlier the year before and say, man, the car looks completely different. One was Troy Trepania and Jack Trepania, uh, which was Troy's father who passed away, which was an awesome guy, and said, wow, if this car is like this in Detroit, it could have, would have been a, a close one. And I said, yeah, well, it's why you learn and do things better. Um, but from that point there at the Grand National that year, there was a lot of a lot of hype and a lot of press on the alley cart, you know, like a Barris and Blackie um, creation from like I think I think 1948, 49. I might be wrong on that year, and they were they're hoping that car to win. And um, you know, Roy Brizio came over to the deal and he says, "Man, I think this might be your year." And Steve Mole came by. He had a car as well. I think this might be a year too. And these are guys I look up to as a kid growing up, you know, and getting that from your peers, you go, wow, you know, but you still don't want to believe it, you know? So Saturday, Saturday night, <clears throat> um, as I found out the magazine editor from Shoot Otter, they go by and shoot a couple of the cars that they feel is going to win for the magazine for the winner. And they were shooting our car and they were shooting the car and I didn't really pick up it until another guy said, hey, they're shooting your car because you're probably going to win the show. And I said, well, I'm not going to count on nothing until Sunday night. And Sunday night, they announced the award and we won the show. And I was still, I wasn't really, I'm not going to say happy. I was probably more shocked. The judges came up to me after the show to congratulate me. And I say, you know, I'm shocked that I won, won this award. And he says, why are you shocked? You had the best damn car here. You had a hundred points, a hundred points. This car was awesome. I said, well, thank you very much. That following Monday, I get a call from Roy Brizio from Brizio Street Rods, and he congratulated me, which I thought was just awesome. He says, you know, your whole life's going to change from this point on, building cars. It's going to change. Mark my word, it's going to change. And um, I didn't quite understand what he meant by that. And so I had a, um, had a customer come into my shop, I don't know, probably that following week, and said, I want to build a car for the Grand National Rocha Show and I want to win the America's Most Beautiful Roadster. And I feel you're my builder that can do that. And I remember telling him, I said, I don't want to build a car again. It was a pain in the ass. You know, I didn't, didn't charge enough, lost my ass on it. I mean, practically went broke doing it. And so we discussed it further and further and further. And a few months later, we agreed to build the car. And I built that car in just, just a little over a year and three months. You know, which is pretty fast if you think about it, because that was in middle of 2008, debut for 2010. And um, the car was actually being built to go, go to Detroit to compete for the Riddler Award. But that's when um, the Grand National Rocha Show changed the rules and said that only first time showing cars can compete at the Grand National when they NBR. No more Detroit cars can come and come here and compete. So that really took the steam out of us because we wanted to go to Detroit to compete for the Riddler and then go to Chicago, the Legends Cup, and then go to the Boise Rocha Show, and then go what you call, that's what they call the Triple Crown, but then go to the Grand National following year and won the NBR. So we couldn't do that, so we went to Pomona, and that was a complete uh, um, cluster. We got the car um, done. It was, uh, we had an open belt drive on the primary, or the uh, exposed belt drive for the timing chain. The belt drive kipped a, kit, uh, chipped, uh, skipped a tooth and shot off the belt and dinged the hood of the car on uh, the night before the show. And when that happened, it dinged the hood. Um, so the hood had to get uh, repainted and smoothed out. And um, I remember the customer, uh, I'm not going to say his name because uh, it's not, not good there. He uh, was down at Grand National, had his display all set up, no car there, and he was sitting in the middle of the display. You know, we were working on this car for probably, I'd say four to five days, 24 hours a day, not going home. There was about seven of us. We hated everybody. We hated each other, you know, no showers, you know, just stinking. And I know the shops out there have done that, so you know what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, he sent his wife in. Wife sat across the, the chair from us, just talking mess to us the whole time. So it was an unpleasant deal. So. We were having some issues getting the car done. Um, we reached out to the Grand National Rocha Show, the promoter, 
and um, he got clearance for the judges to allow us to move in on Friday, um, which was Friday before the show. We had to be there in the car had to be in the display before 12 o'clock on Friday or the car would be disqualified. And they gave us time to work on the car, clean the car afterwards. So when we drove down to the Pomona Fairplex, now where our shop was at, it was about an hour and a half, hour and 45 minute drive doing the speed limit. And I was driving a um, International Western Hauler with a 48 foot Fairlight fifth wheel trailer enclosed with this car and the trailer. And we made it down there in 45 minutes from um, Ventura. I don't know how fast we were going, but we were driving idi like idiots. We got to Pomona Fairplex and they had the security gates down that wouldn't let us in. So I actually drove through the gate and broke the gate off the actual security gate. And they chased me down to the deal and they wanted to arrest me and all that stuff. And we got clearance and it was okay. And they let us let it go. Got the car on the show. Um, there were some people that were very unhappy that they let us in the show. So what they did was they called a protest. They protested us. So then we got dis uh, we got disqualified on Friday afternoon. Um, I was not allowed to attend a meeting that was upstairs. They had um, Chip Foose, he had a car there that year, um, up, up, um, upstairs with the judges, uh, the customer, uh, Pete Shapores, uh, Roy Brizio, other people that won the award of the years that were there in that meeting. And they were talking, and again, I wasn't present, but I heard about it afterwards. Um, Chip spoke up and said that, um, I really feel that you should allow Scott's car to be in the show and uh, because I want to compete against the best, you know, and uh, that's one of the best built cars here. And if you don't allow that car to come in, I'm going to pull my car out of the show. Um, now, I heard that from my customer and I thought that was, you know, pr pretty straight up. So I was walking down uh, from the showroom floor on building four and that's when uh, Chip and Troy Trepania walked up to me and said, well, you look better and look freshened up. So, yeah, I feel better. And he says, well, your car's back on the show. I said, well, that's, that's great news because if it wasn't, you know, we, we're screwed. We couldn't go to Detroit now and everything else. So that was on Saturday. So from there, it just kind of went on. And Saturday night, they were shooting the cars again. And same deal, they shot our car. They shot Chip's car and a couple of the cars there. And yeah, we're just going back and forth. And then on Sunday night, they announced the, the winner. And we, we get, I guess you say, I'm not going to say lucky, but we, we won again. You know, that there was, it, it was a good feeling, but it wasn't, it wasn't the same feeling in 2008 because uh, our customer that year um, wasn't really an appreciative customer. So it kind of really killed the whole, I guess the excitement of the whole thing. And when, the, when, that, when that car got done, I told myself then I'll never build a roadster for the AMBR again the rest of my life because it just ruined it. In 2011, I really started focusing on my business, where I want to be in the next few years. Um, meaning, do I want to stay in California? Do I want to leave the state? And we, are, we were already doing several shows around the country at that time. And we were spending a lot of money flying on planes, rental cars, everything else. And we were shipping a lot of products to the Midwest East Coast. I mean, over and over and over on a regular basis. So I started looking in various states, I mean, for quite a few years. My, some of my guys will say 15 years, I say 12 years, but a long time. I went to Il Illinois, Texas, N Nevada, Arizona, you know, Iowa, Ohio, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina. I mean, it's just a lot of places to look. Tennessee, multiple times. And, but I ended up in Tennessee and we um, made the commitment. Um, Bought a, bought a building in uh, 2017, um, didn't move to 2018, but um, prior to buying that building, I got involved in a very serious relationship. Uh, my wife now, um, she did not want to move to the South at all. Uh, I mean, at all, not 100%. Um, that was probably more my fault because I went, to, I went to areas or towns that were very small, very isolated and taking her from California where her majority of her whole family lives at and all that was kind of like, I mean, taking a part of her life away. And so as we uh, got, you know, as, as the months went on, years went on, she you know I was, I kept on talking about it, more serious about it. And 
everything else. So then she finally agreed on it. Um, we came out to Tennessee, oh man, I bet you at least 14 times. We picked out a house my, my wife found and we bought it, it worked out great. And then we planned our move, but then I had to find a building. And that was another uh, big, big deal there because there wasn't a whole lot of buildings available here in Tennessee at that time. Um, a lot of buildings for rent, but not uh, for sale. But we lucked out, the realtor contacted me and said we have a building available. So we bought the building and um, we closed um, escrow, or the closing building in December, 2017. And so we planned our move for April of 2018. Because we moved at that time, we moved uh, 11 with us to uh, Tennessee, meaning 11 employees. So we moved them. Um, I paid for their move 100% um, out of my pocket. And, um, and then I had a company uh, called Dunkel Brothers uh, Rigging that moved our shop. And um, we moved in five days, um, cross country. Yeah, we um, <clears throat> recently uh, landed our, our, all of our products in Simmer Racing. Um, huge automotive parts company, probably the largest in the world in my opinion. They have four, four locations, corporate office, headquarters in Ohio, uh, largest warehouse being in Texas, one in Nevada, one in Georgia. Um, all of our products are stocked at the Texas warehouse right now for the first year. Then after the first year, they'll be in Ohio, Georgia, and Nevada. Um, they give us multiple POs on a daily basis, which is you know a great feeling. Um, they do get uh, priority over our regular customers because they, they order so much, so the shipping is a lot faster through them. So as I say, you can go to Summer Racing Direct and buy our products and get them faster than going through Scott's Hot Rods. It wasn't just, they called us and said, hey, we want your parts. This is how it's gonna go on their own business five days later. It took actually uh, almost 17 months to get it all finalized. Um, they approached us at Good Guys Ohio Show I uh, came by our booth and introduced uh, themselves and said that we're interested in carrying your suspension parts and chassis parts and your accessory parts and our product line. Would you be interested in that? And I said, of course I would. And the next thing he said, it's going to be a very long process to get it locked in. How long? Oh, probably six months. Well, six months turned to 17 months. So it was a lot longer. And it got a lot more involved because we have 7 million part numbers. So it was a lot more than they anticipated and it locked up their system when we gave them the partners in this. We had to go back and bring out down to 200,000 part numbers and then we're slowly sending stuff over there on a weekly basis, which Cameron handles that 100% our marketing manager who did the part number, the database, the SKU numbers for summer racing. And he spent um, probably over 12 months doing that. And so it's a lot, a lot, a lot of work. But what it's done for us, and it's helped us out because, you know, we ship our, we ship our products now worldwide ourselves. but summer racing customer base is shit a million times larger than our customer base is. And there's people out there that will buy just from summer racing only because the return policy is awesome. Their customer service is exceptional. Um, their ship time is, is ex exceptional. And, um, but what it's done for us, it's, it's really, well, it makes our product, you know, feel better, look better, because you can go to summitracing.com and type in Scott's Hot Rods. There's 85, 90 pages of our products on the website right now, list it. Their catalogs have our parts in them. They do press release with our parts in them. So we're actually quite excited about it and they're excited about it. You know, we have a, a very good work, working relationship with multiple people at Summit Racing. They call us daily and ask questions and so we have a good working relationship. So I think it's an awesome, awesome deal for us. Honestly, I, I would disagree. I wouldn't say that because I don't. I don't really don't categorize ourselves as a top five, top one, two, three, four, five, or ten shops in the in the country. I have a 900 foot ladder, my goal ladder. When I reach that 900 feet, I guess I'll be the top shop in the world. But right now, I'm at 100 feet right now. I still got 800 more feet to climb. Um, I don't. I don't. I don't look at ourselves and categorize our shop as this or this or this. Um, what I like to say is we are one of the most complete shops in the country. And what that means 
is we have the ability to manufacture, machine, build, pretty much anything we want to build in-house. We do all of our own sheet metal work here in-house 100%. Um, we shape bodies from scratch out of flat sheet metal. We don't build fiberglass cars here. I do not do restorations here. We don't build motors here at all though. Um, we put motors in, wire them, all that. We can machine anything you can imagine. Who do you consider as the top few builders in the country? Mm, well, build, builders, that, builders that I look on their cars and design um, that, I, that, I, that I do appreciate the quality of work they do is uh, Troy Trepanya from Rad Rides by Troy. Very detail oriented and he has been ever since I was following him from back when he was a lot younger than he is now. Um, I would say that's probably the, the one shop that I actually look, that, that, I, that I look at a lot. And um, there are other shops out there that, that, are, that are well too, but I think that's probably the one shop I probably focus on the most. So we don't feel in any ways that we're better than other people. Um, that's not our attitude at all. Uh, we truly worry about ourselves here, our own product, our, what we do here day in and day out, and that's, that's what we do. Yes, that's correct. And to um, to build a car for that show, you have to, you have to have the right client, and um, we do have the right client. He's out of Indiana. Um, he appreciates good quality work. He doesn't doesn't pressure you in the time frame. He says when it's done, it's done. And um, it's a car that we're building from scratch, 100%. Um, and I say scratch the body out of flat sheet metal, suspension components all completely one-off, down to the nuts and bolts and washers, all one-off, machined here in-house. Um, we're gonna be machining the intake here in-house as well. So, I mean, the car will be one-off as, one as it can possibly be. And, um, and like I said, as I said in a very nice way, we're building a car to win the show. Um, we're not building a car to show up and getting the grade eight because all that is seven losers and one winner. And, um, so if you don't win the Riddler, you lose. And, um, you know, a lot of people hate on that show because they say it's judged wrong and it's not judged fairly. Well, I'm a firm believer, and I know people are gonna disagree when I say this. That show, they judge cars there and they're not judging usually the best car that wins. They're driving the car that has all the right categories crossed and their points and sections. And I know people disagree with me on that and they think there's politics. Well, I guess there could be, could be politics, but you know, <clears throat> I feel if you have all your dots and T's crossed, you're gonna win that show. And, um, and I truly feel that show is probably the only show right now in the country that's judged fairly, in my opinion. And again, this is my opinion, guys. But um, the car that we're building, uh, one's, one's gonna be done, who knows? May it'll be next year if Detroit comes on. Detroit got canceled here recently. Maybe the year after. Maybe the year after that. Maybe 10 years from now. But when it's done, you're gonna know about it. Well, I've made a lot of mistakes in my, in my business career. And um, it's how you learn from mistakes. And believe me, you're gonna make mistakes every week. And if you say you're not gonna make mistakes, get out of the business right now, do something different. Um, but my advice for all shops, and even, even my, my business here, is you have to reinvest in your business to be successful. And what I mean by that, you know, as you can afford to buy equipment, you need to get tooling that you feel that can make you more efficient, do better quality work. And, um, and you have to have the right personnel if you're gonna have a shop with more, more than one employee. Because um, bad, bad employees can ruin your business too. Um, as much as bad employers can ruin your business too. But for me, what, what I tell myself is that when I, when I go buy something, I won't buy it if I can't pay for it. And when I mean pay for it, I pay for it in full. I don't finance my equipment, my tooling, um, my semi truck and trailer that I just bought a new one on, paid for it in full. 
Um, and I'm not saying I have to brag here. I'm just saying that it's just this, that's why I tell myself because I was that shop back in the day. I'd have multiple loans out. I would have an easy seven, eight loans at a bank for $10,000 a piece of equipment, 5,000 here, 15,000 there. Well, then you got 12 payments to a bank every month. And it doesn't matter if the payment's 200 bucks or $5,000, it adds up. And when you have a slow month or, or a bad month or customer doesn't pay you, and you don't have reserve in your bank, you're gonna be defaulting your payments. Now, I was never default on my payments because if I didn't, I didn't have the money to pay my um, pay him. I didn't pay myself that month. And I just, I paid my, my bills. And then two advice for, and a good advice for shops starting up. Um, I would look at what you can possibly develop a part that you can sell. Um, look at the whole, look at the industry, you know, see what's being made out there. I mean, if you want to make suspension parts, make suspension parts. There's room for everybody out there. There's plenty of business for everybody out there. But the name of the game is doing a quality work and being honest and you and you and you will be successful is that at our business here you know we manufacture chassis suspension parts a lot of billet components fuel tanks rear suspension kits and we also build cars and trucks in our facility here. So from a business standpoint, we're 95% manufacturing, 5% labor. So what that means to the people out there is we could not do any more cars and just build chassis and suspension parts and we'll probably make more money. But that won't happen um, because we still enjoy building cars. And what the cars do for us it allows us to create, design new products that we can bring to the general public and sell. And we have a great customer base that allow us to use our imagination when it comes to building cars. And they trust us with our vision. So it works out very, very well. Um, but with that, you know, you have, to have a, you have to have a talented crew. You know, if this was 25 years ago, I can do it all myself, you know, one man bandwagon. But in today's time, there's absolutely no way to do it myself. There's no way, you know, we get a couple hundred calls a day, uh, a few hundred emails a day phone rings nonstop. We have deliveries every day, shipments going out every day, and um, every, everybody working. So there's an income of, in, of in, inventory, parts, products, materials, tech calls. But to make that work correctly, you have to have the right team. And like I said, and we have right now, I, I feel we have one of the best teams out in the country. Get a hold of uh, Scott's Hot Rods in Knoxville, Tennessee. Um, you can go to scottshotrods.com. We have an online shopping cart, active website, 24 hours a day. You can email scotts at scottshotrods.com, justin at scottshotrods.com, sales at scottshotrods.com, cam at scottshotrods.com, jeff at scottshotrods.com, and accounts at scottshotrods.com, which is Marcy Hines. Um, or you can call 865-951-2081 or 1-800-273-9195. And that's for all the toll-free guys that want to pay you 25 cents to call us. Or you can go to summitracing.com and place your order there. And we take orders on the phone daily, email orders daily. And when you do call Scott's Hot Rods Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m., Eastern time, you'll get a live voice on the phone, guaranteed. And when you ask a question about a product, you'll get an intelligent answer on the product, on the product too, on the phone, guaranteed.